a, a masterclass because time is tight. Okay, so let me ask you one of the most important questions that you will ever ask yourself. When you come to the end of your life, how will you judge that your one and only life has been a success? And, and that's a, a really interesting question to ask people. And my bet is that if we had time for you to shout out how you would define if your life had been successful, these are the kinds of things you are likely to say. The first one that comes up is happiness. People say, I want my life to be happy. I want the people I care about to have been happy. People say, I hope that the relationships I have had in my life were loving and constructive and life-giving. People say, I hope that I will have done something that will make a difference. People say, I hope I will have accomplished the things that were really important to me. And people say, I hope that I'll have been my best self. I hope I won't have any regrets. And implied in that is the idea that we all know that we have a completely unique portfolio of strengths and talents and experience, and, and we want to mine that and use that. And when you're at your best like that, you have the holy trinity. You feel good. You're doing good. You're doing good things and you're doing well in the world that you function in. And in fact, like, that isn't just a, an accessory that you can leave outside the door, but we have really good data that for the organization that you're working in, that if you can answer genuinely, I strongly agree with this proposition, that when I come into my work every day, I have the opportunity to be the best that I can be, it's associated with all of the criteria of success that every business, including venture, venture capitalism, uh, depends on. But we live in a world that is difficult and hard. We live in a world that is extraordinarily competitive. We live in a world where we have all the blessings of rapid technological change, but also all the disruption. And all of you know Bill Gates's famous idiom that Microsoft was only ever two years uh, away from failure. And I, I talked uh, to a very senior uh, Intel manager last year when I was doing some, some work for the organization. I've been working with them for a long time now. And he said, I tell my folks, this is the least amount of change you are ever going to experience. So the problem statement is, how can we be our best selves? How can we be happy in that broad, general way that most people define a successful life in the kind of world that we uh, live in? So I'm going to give you my version of an answer in terms of rules or guidelines and one is the ability to adapt, which is really an another way of saying resilience is now, I believe, the master emotional uh, competence. And we know that Darwin was onto this a long, long time ago. And he said it wasn't the strongest that were going to survive. It was those who were most adaptable to change. And we're entering, like every generation before us, a future which is unknowable. I'm sure many of you are aware of the classic um, study of, of humans' ability to predict anything. And the results, it's a very robust study, and the results really um, show that we are dismal at protecting the future. And this study involved 284 of the top experts in the States, who were economists, political commentators, uh, corporate CEOs, etc. 
And they were asked to make a series of predictions about economic, uh, the economic future and all of the derivatives of that in a medium term, short term and long term way. And they were guaranteed anonymity. And then in the beauty of this research is all you have to do is just wait around for 10 years and then you can see whether the predictions were right or wrong. And what the study found was that the predictions were mostly universally wrong. But what was interesting was that he divided the, the uh, predictors into what he called foxes and hedgehogs. The hedgehogs were the people with one big idea in which they were extraordinarily confident. They rated their own predictions with the most confidence. They were predictably the most popular on the media because the media love people who are absolutely sure of what they're saying. And they were the most wrong. <laughs> the least wrong were what he called foxes. And they were the people who snuffled around everywhere. They looked to multiple sources to keep checking what their intuitions were. They were the least confident about their, uh, uh, about their um, predictions, and that's why they kept snuffling around. Uh, they were quite adaptable in terms of they would pick up information from the most unlikely sources, and they were the least wrong. And so I suppose what I'm saying to you is don't be a hedgehog, be a fox. Rule number two is develop an open mindset. You probably are aware of this uh, book that was recently published by Alec Ross, who is Hillary Clinton's um, senior innovative advisor. And he has spent uh, the last uh, few years globally traveling, looking at innovation everywhere. And he concluded that the old paradigm was the big at the small. That was the it, dichotomy that most, uh, was most important in the world. And it's particularly relevant, I think, you know, with all of the discussion about women investors, et cetera, and as it were, your smallness in comparison to the, the big beasts, as it were, uh, that you're competing with. But he said, now that's not the dichotomy anymore. The dichotomy now is whether you're open or closed, whether you're open-minded or closed. And that we have to be open-minded at all of these different levels. Open-minded, open to influence, open to risk, open to learning, open boundaries at a personal and a corporate level. Rule number three is we have to start with the source of our greatest possibility and the source of our inherent limitations, and that's the human brain. The, when we all came out of the primeval swamp, we had a reptilian brain only that does the plain vanilla of measuring your, uh, regulating your metabolism and your breathing and so on. But the next bit that evolution designed, as it were, was the emotional brain. And the reason that the emotional brain developed is because your brain is primarily interested only in your survival. That is the only thing that your brain is concerned about. And we know that the brain is structured to give emotions a preeminent role in human functioning because emotions are given to us not to make us just feel good or feel bad or to torment us. It is essentially as a guide to action in things that are too important to leave to the intellect. So all of those things, our motivation, how we think, the quality of our thinking, the quality of our judgment, how we react to other people, and how we react to the new are primarily driven by uh, emotions. And on the, the green side are the 10 basic positive emotions that we, uh, as it were, are wired into our brains and all their variants, and on the other side, the negative. And the reason we have negative emotions is to defend us from threat, to alert us to threat and help us to react to it. And we do that by contracting. When we see or hear a threat, the brain shuts down everything extraneous and we are concerned only with 
seeing whether that threat is coming nearer or retreating. It's marvelous for life-threatening situations, but you can see its huge limitations in the world that we, we live in now. But positive emotions were not simply given to women so that they could be emotional. Positive emotions were given to us for the other twin of survival, which is recognizing opportunity and becoming, knowing how to react. And when we, when we are made aware by the spontaneous experience of any of those positive emotions, when we're aware that there is an opportunity in the horizon, we know what to do because every system in our brain and body is uh, getting us ready by expanding. So all the lights go on. We hear more, we, we see more, we see more possibilities, and our whole instinct is to approach build connections, and build resources uh, for the future. That is the function of each and every positive emotion. But of course, each emotion has its own specific action tendency. And I will just talk to you a little bit about inspiration, since that's the theme of this great two days. Inspiration has a touch of the divine about it. And for a long, long time, it was the province of theologians only. But psychological research, which is quite recent on inspiration, is absolutely fascinating about what inspiration does. Inspiration occurs spontaneously. And the effect that it has on us is to open it up, open up to us the possibility of seeing something extraordinary something that preceded us, something that's bigger than us, something that's far more noble than the sort of things that we are normally uh, aware of. So there is still a touch of the divine, actually, about inspiration. And inspiration is associated with a rise in open-mindedness. It's associated with an increase in self-esteem. It's associated with a strong urge to put into action whatever it is that it has inspired you to do. Unlike many other positive emotions which make you feel good, inspiration moves us very urgently towards doing something. It makes us much better at mastering work, but what's interesting is the kind of work that we want to master isn't the usual stuff of getting ahead of competitors. It is aligning ourselves with something that is much, much more important. So you see yourself as part of a much bigger picture, something that is happening in your time and in your era that you want to be part of. But positive and negative are not equal. They're quite asymmetrical in their impact because your brain doesn't want you to miss a threat. If you miss a threat, you're not around for the next opportunity. You can miss multiple opportunities and still get more. And so the negative is designed to be extraordinarily powerful. It's designed to get your attention, to hold on to your attention, to make, every, to make the potential threat sticky. And this affects every single element. Uh, of our, our functioning. We know, for example, that first impression is hugely important in life. The, people, the first impression we create of ourselves, of our business, of our ideas, and we know that in that anything between a microsecond and 30 second, that first impression is going to have an enormous implication in terms of whether anyone is going to give you the time and attention to keep engaging with you until somebody gets the, as it were, the fullness of what it is that you are offering. But if you form a negative first impression, it will take nine bits of contradictory positive information before you are ready to even reconsider. So positive first impressions, while they're extraordinarily helpful, are nowhere near as powerful uh, as that. 
And so the first rule we need, or the fourth rule, as it were, that we need to flourish in this life, to be happy and to be our best self, is to stop being vandals about negativity. God knows, but life is full enough of negativity, threats that we can't control and that are going to keep happening. But we, we chuck our own gratuitous negativity, personally and organizationally, into the arena, and we have the same attitude as we once had to the environment. We think it'll go away. It'll go up in the air, it'll go into the ground, it'll go into the ocean, and we'll never see it again. And it has exactly the same error at its core. So be like the doctors who take the Hippocratic Oath. Do a negativity audit, because your guiding principle should be first, do no harm. In a study, for example, a uh, Harvard study of 12,000 events in the ordinary workday across multiple industry sectors. The tiniest positive or negative event, and I'm not talking about major good news or bad news, just the small ups and downers of the day have an extraordinarily powerful effect on not just your productivity, but your innovation and your creativity. The more small positive events that you can create and enable in your day, the more likely it is, it's 50% more likely actually, that you're going to have a creative good idea. Positive events, because of their effect on your brain, induce a breadth of cognition that will last not just for that day, but will last actually for several days uh, afterwards. And the connection, again, to go back to the asymmetry between negative and positive, the connection between mood and negative events is five times stronger than the effect between a positive event and, and, uh, and, and, and the behavior afterwards and, and creativity. Rule number five is, what it then is the right ratio between positive and negative? Since we can't and we shouldn't ever get rid of the negative anyway, but what is the right ratio? And the ratio is you have to have a very high ratio of positive to absorb the impact of the negative. Just to be ordinary, just to be average, just not to get into trouble, you need a ratio of three positives to every negative. But if you want to be sure that you are flourishing, if you want to be sure that your organization is flourishing, if you want to be sure that the most important relationships in your life are flourishing, you need to ramp that up to five. And so that's a fundamental change in our attitude. None of us now, or not except on bad days, will get up in the morning and hope that we'll get fit or hope that we lose that persistent two pounds. We might hope, but it's not going to happen. We have to have strategies, we have to be conscious, we have to all the time, you know, as it were, keep an eye on, on the goal of the day. And yet, most of us get up in the morning and hope that we will have a good day. And hoping you will have a good day is about as useful as hoping that that two pounds will have disappeared by the end uh, of the day. Rule number six is that in the world of extraordinary opportunity that we live in, being happy has a premium. Because it doesn't matter that we're dealing with Brexit, Brexit and all of the other uh, cold winds that are blowing. There's always going to be something like that. But the important thing is that in comparison to your parents' generation, in comparison to other parts of the world, we live in a world abundant with opportunity. When we experience positive emotions, it broadens out our thought action repertoire. We can keep, when we're confronted with something, we simply think of more options, more courses of action that we can take. We see more, we hear more, we take in more. We are, we have, we're much more inclined to do approach behavior, go towards it, and we have more playfulness, 
more resilience, more innovation. All of that positions us to be alert to opportunity and to take that opportunity. That's the mechanism, as it were, that allows happiness to give us this extraordinary uh, premium. Your brain is about a third more productive when you're feeling positive than it is when you're feeling neutral or negative. This is just a, an example of the power of this. There, was, there has been a number of experiments with highly trained physicians in the States who were brought into laboratories, supposedly, uh, on a, a study of their diagnostic abilities. And it is a study of their, but of course, the focus of the research was something else. And these doctors were given a portfolio of cases, symptoms, signs, etc. They were asked to make a diagnosis as quickly as they could and to think of a number of interventions that the, the patient uh, could have. And uh, the doctors were divided in two. They were equally qualified. They, equ they got the same portfolios, but one group got a little pack of cookies, uh, eight, with a little note saying, a small token of our appreciation of giving us your time. That group made the most accurate diagnoses in the shortest time. They showed far more interest in the patients, and they thought of many, many more interventions that could be uh, used to, to uh, resolve the, the patient's problems. Exactly what you want your doctor to do if you go. You want him to make a quick diagnosis, you want him to be intensely interested in you, and you want him to have loads of ideas about what you can do to sort out your problem. And this is on the basis only of inducing a feeling of thankfulness or being appreciated uh, you know, it, to the extent that eight little, little uh, uh, chocolates could do it. If you take Two kids who have the same qualifications at age 18, but one is consistently more positive than the other. It has a more positive mood. Then what you find if you follow those kids through is that the one who is more positive is more likely to get job interviews, more likely to be successful at job interviews, more likely to be op offered interesting and complex work, more likely to enjoy their work, more likely to be uh, evaluated positively by their managers, more likely to be promoted, more likely to be earning slightly more money in their early 30s. What a dividend. But that doesn't tell us why or how this works. Why happiness is a predictor of life success. But we got another clue from a study that was done of young women aged 22 uh, who were uh, in college in America. And they, uh, at the end of the, you know, the, the year, they had the college yearbook, you know, where you get your photograph taken, you say something dumb underneath. And uh, as part of some bigger experiment, these photographs of this class of young women were given to ordinary folks like you and, or extraordinary folks like you, and they were asked simply, they were given no information about the women, they were simply asked to rank the women in terms of how happy they thought they were, which they did. And then the researchers followed up the women as they went through the life cycle. They followed them up in their late 20s, their early 40s, their early 50s, and what they found was that the most successful women broadly defined like we defined happiness earlier. The women with the best relationships, the women who still enjoyed their work, uh, the women who felt happy, who were engaged in their lives, etc., were the women that were ranked the happiest all these years ago at age 22. But it still didn't tell us how this happens. And then another researcher uh, took, many decades later, took the same photographs gave them to a group of people again, but this time didn't ask them anything about happiness. He simply asked them, would you please rank these women in terms of how intelligent you are, how competent they are, how um, uh, uh, trustworthy you think they are? If you were hiring someone, rank them in terms of the women you would offer jobs to. If you were dating someone, rank them in terms of the women that you'd be most likely to ask out or you think would be asked out by someone who was dating, which they did. And the rankings for all of those qualities correlated with the original rankings of happiness. In other words, those that we perceive in the absence of other information, 
That first impression we get of someone, those that we perceive as positive and happy, we are also likely to think they must be smart, they must be competent, they're probably trustworthy, and they're worth investing in. So that is what positivity does. Positivity induces in other people the tendency to cooperate. And just imagine how easy your life would be domestically and also in your work if people were ready to cooperate with you. And that is an extraordinarily interesting finding because in the networked world we now live in, in the flat democratic structures that we now all operate in, at least theoretically, in our relationships and in our workplace, the most important quality now that everybody is striving for is the ability to cooperate and collaborate. And positivity is at the absolute heart uh, of that. So happiness will do all that. It won't guarantee it, but it makes it far more likely that all of those good things will happen. Also, all of you, I'm sure, are concerned about monitoring your body mass and keeping fit and giving up cigarettes, all very important for your longevity and the quality of your life. But how happy you are is actually a more powerful predictor of how long you live and how well you will live. Chronic negative feelings of disappointment, irritability, anxiety, worry, knock about 10 years uh, off, off your life. Rule number six is the ability to rebalance positivity and negativity is the key to resilience. There is a very interesting set of studies that were done that looked at people who had been through extraordinary diverse, uh, adversity in their lives. These were people that had nightmare things happen to them. They lost children in very traumatic circumstances. They became paralyzed as young people for life. They, were, they got diagnoses of life-threatening diseases. They were caught in floods and terrorist attacks and they lost homes and all kinds of horrible stuff. And the researchers followed up when all the drama was over and they wondered what happened to people like that. And what they found, which I think is an extraordinarily inspiring finding, is that very few of us go under when these things happen to us. It seems like the biggest gift we've got is our adaptability. But the adaptability is like your immune system. It only really kicks in when it needs to. You may go into a flap when you lose your car keys and think, how would I cope with anything really big? And yet, each person in this audience has been through some kind of crisis, hopefully not as bad as that, and here you are still standing. Because that adaptability only kicks in when it needs to. And I think if you really internalize that, you would actually never get depressed. You actually would be fearless. And what he discovered was that, of course, when bad things happen, your functioning goes down. You're just not as, you don't operate as well as you normally do. And some people, stayed really below what happened to them. They survived, but they stayed below their previous functioning. But a very significant mi minority actually recovered in time. They had different lives. Their lives were not the same, but they actually recovered and were back to the same level. But what nobody really predicted was that another very significant minority not just survived, not just recovered, but they actually reached a level of functioning that they had never reached before in their lives. And these were people who were not Pollyannas. These were people who were enormously cognizant of the scale of the losses that they had suffered. These were people who really had suffered, who were grieving for what they had lost. But at a certain point, something switched. And what switched? was they switched from negative to positive. But they didn't do it by any sort of application of the power of positive thinking. 
What happened is they began to see that for every crisis that you suffer, that you discover something extraordinary about yourself. You discover that you are braver than you ever thought you were. You discover that you have more resources than you ever thought you had. You discover that you have more determination. You discover something about yourself which you never knew you had and which you know will now never desert you. Anyone who has been through any crisis will recognize that feeling. You recognize that there were very special people who stood by you, and those relationships are like gold in your life. You recognize that you, like everybody around you, is human and frail, and that we all need each other. So you have a sort of a filament of compassion that binds us one to another, and you learn wisdom. And that is what turned the tide. So when people flourished under fire, they didn't do it in spite of what happened them. They did it because of what happened them. And I think a great way to begin to trigger that process in yourself even in the face of the ordinary, everyday setbacks and failures that all of us suffer, is to ask yourself, does this setback allow me to do something that I otherwise would never have done or could never have done? And the answer is always yes. The answer is always yes. Rule number seven, your emotions aren't just your own business. Your emotions are highly contagious. Emotions are like viruses, and they spread rapidly through groups. So when there is someone happy and positive in your life, that is going to spread to you and have the same effects on you as happiness has on them. There's really, really interesting evidence now that if you look at the pattern of contagion of emotions, you know, in large groups of people, that it, it's almost identical to the pattern of infection, like a viral infection. So the people you're closest to physically, the people that you're most dependent on, their emotions are the most contagious. And so that really is solid evidence that all that stuff about leadership actually has a grain of scientific truth uh, behind it. Your happiness directly causes other people to feel happy with all of the benefits that I talked about earlier, the way it induces people to believe in you, to give you the benefit of the doubt, and to cooperate with you. And that will spread right through a network, whether it's extended family or a network of friends or a group like this, or a company that you work in. Every happy colleague or friend that you add to your network will increase your happiness by 9%. So you add three positive people to your network, and your own happiness and all that goes with it will increase by a third. So we are all fish in the same water. Our happiness affects other people so we have a responsibility, not just to ourselves, but to everybody that we care about, and the companies and the work that we care about, to push our own happiness and to learn how to do it in the right uh, priority in our lives. And group mood affects the performance of the entire group. This is just one example. In a cardiac unit, where the and these were very seriously ill people, where the nurse's mood was generally described as depressed, the death rate among patients was four times higher than in comparable groups. Rule number eight, 40% of your happiness is under your own control. 50% is genetic in the sense, really, via the kind of temperament that uh, you're born with. Everything that we spend 90% of our time concerned about 
our age, our income, our education, whether we're married, single, or divorced, our religion, our children, our health, our gender, our appearance. Some of these have zero effect on your happiness. For example, appearance has zero effect on your happiness, which is bad news for all the beauties in this room. All that matters is how attractive you think you are. But cumulatively, all of those things that we spend 90% of our effort in contribute only 10% to our happiness. Because your brain was not designed to make you happy. Your brain was designed to help you survive, and one of the ways it helps you survive is uh, it puts you on a treadmill so that when you get something, it gives you a boost of happiness, it lasts for a while, and then you just take it for granted and there is no more benefit from it, so you have to go out and do some more and get some more. So that's why it's sort of really, as my father used to say, my late father, a mugs game to be too concerned about these things. You will get a boost, but the boost won't last very long. That leaves 40% under a different heading. And the heading we know from good science is what's called intentional activities. Choosing the way that you think. Choosing the actions you take in the world. These are the important things. And choosing the goals that you want to pursue with your life. One of the most impressive guys I ever worked with, who was sort of a middle manager, was a really extraordinary person. And I said to him, can you describe to me how you go about your life? And he said, in every situation I go into, I try to make it happier. And it had extraordinary effects uh, on the people around him. The people loved him, and they did such incredible work for him. Rule number nine is don't focus on the past, focus on the possible. When we compare the present with the past, we inevitably miss opportunities. Compare always with what's possible. And I was really interested in the debate on gender, because I think it's a critical thing about gender and diversity. It's like we have to focus always on the possible, because otherwise we're too defeated by the evidence before our eyes. Imagine the best possible future that we can have ourselves, for our children, for our work, for our companies, and then work backwards from there. Because there's really interesting stuff about regrets, and that comes up fairly often in people's definition of how they regard a successful life, is not having any major regrets. When you ask people to think, say, over the past two months, what do they regret? The list you get is acts of commission, stuff we did that we know we shouldn't have done. We had one drink too many. We had one stupid conflict too many. You know, we made a mistake. So things we did that we regretted. But you ask people a different question. You say, look over your whole life. What do you regret? And then what comes up is a different list. It's a list of the things you wish you had done and you didn't. So if you're going to have regrets at the end of your life, have the right kind of regrets. Have the regrets that involved doing the stupid things, taking the risks and doing the stupid things, having the conflicts and making it up. But don't end your life thinking, I had a chance and I didn't do it. There was a risk and I didn't take it. Rule number 10 is be optimistic. This actually single-handedly brought Ireland through the recession. <laughs> there is remarkably little evidence that optimism is ever bad for you. Really, really remarkably little in the thousands of studies that have done. One of the biggest studies of women's health, for example, an American study which went on for 10 years and involved several hundred thousand people, and they compared women on all of the ordinary factors if you're looking at health, their socioeconomic uh, state, their health status, their health habits, their family history, all that kind of stuff. And they also measured optimism and pessimism. 
And then at the end, they compared like with like. They compared smokers with smokers and non-smokers with non-smokers and people with a history of certain disease with those with no family history, etc., etc. And what they found was that all other things being equal, optimistic women suffered one third fewer deaths due to heart disease. One third fewer deaths, simply on the basis of being optimistic. When you look at what happens to the human brain when people are optimistic as opposed to when people are pessimistic, when people are pessimistic, the threat center, the amygdala in their brain is very active because they're, as it were, hyper alert to threat. What's interesting is that optimists are equally alert to threat. Their amygdala is as alert when they see a sign of a threat coming. But what's interesting is that the part of their brain that gets them ready to react to opportunity is equally active. So when you're optimistic, you're again, you're not, be, you're not blinding yourself to threat. You're alert to threat, but you're equally alert to uh, opportunity. And that is a fabulous strategy uh, for life. There was a study done by a Harvard professor of economic history, and he looked at all the countries of the world on, for which there were written records, and he looked, what he was trying to find out is what makes countries sustainably economically successful over several centuries. You know, he looked at things like climate, and obviously that has an effect, etc. but he identified two factors that identify countries that are sustainably economically successful. One is openness to science and technology, whether that was the printing press or whether it's the internet. And the second is a country's cultural optimism. And he had this fabulous quote at the end. He said, in this world, the optimists have it, not because they're always right, but because they are positive. Even when wrong, they are positive, and that is the way of achievement, correction, improvement, and success. Educated, eyes open, optimism pays. Pessimism can only offer the empty consolation of being right. I'm going to quote uh, our Nobel laureate, um, Seamus Heaney, for my last remark. And I do this in tribute to my old, old friend, Maggie Cavallaris, that I know loves this quote. Because Inspire Fest is all about inspiration. Inspiration, as I said earlier, is all about, it's a gift. It comes by way of gift to us. And it opens us up to a reality of possibilities that precedes us and will succeed us. It links us up to our time and our era in a completely different way. It ennobles us. And I think after two days like this, all of you are inspired, you're connected, what Heaney called earthed lightning. You're both inspired, but you're grounded in the reality of the world that you live in. And he has this wonderful line in his poem, and I will use it to say to you what is really, I think, a great way to live. Let inspiration catch the heart off guard and blow it open. Thank you. Want to be in the audience next time? Click here for tickets to InspireFest 2017.